Hello there. Today I would like to talk about gambesons. Now for those of you unfamiliar with a gambeson, it is armor made from quilted fabric. Now the first point I'd like to make is that the term gambeson is a bit confusing in that it refers to three very different types of cloth armor. Let's go over these three very quickly. One type, also referred to as an arming doublet, consisted of between two to four layers of material. Often the internal layers were made of wool and the outer layers were made of some stouter cloth. This garment was intended to provide padding for an external layer of armor, such as mail or plate. Because of this, the arming doublet was often very thin, as I mentioned, typically only two to four layers, because if you put a lot of bulk underneath your mail, you won't be able to move properly. The next sort of armor, also referred to as an akaton, is designed to be worn either over top of mail or else as standalone armor. This armor was constructed of a great many layers of linen, generally between 8 and 36 layers. These armors could often be 2 or 3 inches thick. This armor, because of its great bulk, was not worn underneath mail. The third sort, also known as a padded jack, was made from two layers of cloth that had been stuffed very densely with a loose fill. This loose fill was often just whatever was to hand. It could be horsehair, straw, unspun wool, or else just scrap cloth. These armors were often homemade and reserved for people who couldn't afford anything better. Now the term gambeson, as well as the alternative terms that I've provided, were often used interchangeably. Because of this, there's a great deal of confusion in the historical community surrounding what gambesons actually were. And numerous times I have heard people combine the attributes of all three of these garments, despite the fact they are very different. I've heard people speak of 30 layer gambesons that were worn underneath your armor and were so cheap that everybody could afford one. This is simply not the case. The cheapness of gambesons is often an overstated point. Now, the sort that was two layers stuffed with loose fill could indeed be very cheap. Often it was homemade by peasant levies. Oh, I've been called up? Fine. Wife, get two of my shirts and stuff them full of straw and hopefully that'll keep me alive. I tried making one of these in the past and if you stuff them densely enough it's fairly easy to make them cut proof. They're also pretty good against blunt force, but arrows and spears go through them like they're not even there. The other two sorts of gambeson were not cheap. Arming doublets were designed for people who can already afford proper armor, and as such were very finely tailored. Many layer gambesons were expensive, not necessarily because of quality craftsmanship, but because of the sheer amount of material involved. Finding accurate historical prices is often very difficult, if not impossible. Even when you find a historical price listing, you can't always be certain of the quality of the object. With gambesons, it's particularly difficult because you don't even know what sort of gambeson they're talking about. Is the object in question made from 40 layers of the finest linen? Or is it made from someone's worn out old blue jeans stuffed with dried pea pods? Something we can learn with a fair degree of accuracy is the time to manufacture. The Ribe Viking Center did an experiment to see how long it would take to make a Viking Age shirt. Link to the article in the description. In the article, they go over every step of the process, from plowing the ground, to harvesting the flax, to weaving the linen, to sewing the shirt. Their total time works out to be about 350 hours for a shirt. The overwhelming majority of this time was in the spinning of the thread and the weaving of the cloth. So, using simple math, we should be able to extrapolate the labor cost of a gambeson fairly easily. First, let's set aside the sewing time of 17 hours as this wouldn't necessarily increase exponentially. Now we simply multiply it by 10 for a 10 layer gambeson. This gives us 3,470 hours, which is quite a time investment. That's more time than most people will spend on their favorite video game. But some gambesons were more than 10 layers. We have evidence that some of them were over 30 layers. So let's further multiply it by three. This gives us a whopping total of 10,410 man hours simply to weave the cloth for a 30 layer gambeson. Add on another 15 or 20 hours to sew. Now does this 30 layer gambeson still sound like a cheap garment that anyone could afford? Or like something you could manufacture in your downtime? Even in the present day with all of our modern industrial processes to make fabric dirt cheap, 
I've hardly heard of any reenactors going for a full 30 layer linen garment because it would require 30 yards of linen. Even going for a conservative price of $20 a yard, that's still over $600 before you've even started sewing. For comparison, it took me about 500 hours to weave my coat of mail, although I had the benefit of starting with pre-made wire, and a little over 100 hours to forge a pattern-welded Anglo-Saxon sword. Though again, pre-made steel. Also for comparison, the excellent book North American Aboriginal Hide Tanning by Morgan Balgarian gives 60 hours as the time to tan a buffalo hide. The type of gambeson made of many layers was not a cheap garment. Another thing that is said of gambesons is that they were light armor. This is true of the arming doublet, mine weighs only about two pounds, and it's also true of the sort stuffed with loose fill. The one I made years ago weighed about five pounds. It is not true that the sort made of many layers was light armor. We can estimate the weight of one of these garments by simply doubling mine. Right now it consists of three layers and weighs a little under two pounds. So if we double that, we get six layers that weighs about four pounds. We double that, we get 12 layers that weighs eight pounds. We double that, we get 24 layers that weighs 16 pounds. And if we double that again, we get 48 layers that weighs a whopping 32 pounds. For comparison, a steel cuirass weighs less than 15 pounds generally, and my coat of mail weighs a little under 28 pounds. The many-layer gambeson was not light armor. Another thing that's said about gambesons is that they are flexible armor. This is true to a point. While it's true that they are flexible, the sheer bulk of them can restrict your mobility. Imagine wearing 30 shirts at once. I don't think you could move your arms properly. It is for this reason that most gambesons throughout history were sleeveless, and those that did have layers only had a few layers in the armpits and the elbows. One question that you might ask is, is it hot? The answer is yes, it's like wearing a winter coat. You can get used to it, but it's still uncomfortable in the summer. Another thing that's said about gambesons is that it is very good against blunt force. Now this is true. It is very good against blunt force. However, it is not exceptional when compared to other armors. A single piece of plate steel or thick leather is about as effective as 20 layers of gambeson, and it needs to be over 30 layers to compete with my splint armor or my wooden slat armor. So it's good against blunt force, but it's not significantly better than other options. Well, up till now, all I've said so far has been pretty negative. So you might be asking the question, well, why would you bother with this cloth armor? The answer is that it's really good in combination with other armors. If I wear this arming doublet under my coat of mail, underneath my lamellar breastplate, that combination is able to stop almost anything I throw at it. If I remove any one of the three, the other two perform significantly less well. Against blunt force, the leather distributes the force of the blow, the mail has mass and inertia to help resist it, and then the padding underneath absorbs whatever's left. Against arrows, the leather absorbs the initial shock of the arrow, preventing it from busting open the rings of the mail. The mail prevents it from penetrating more than about a half an inch, and then the tough cloth prevents it from entering the body. The final thing I would like to address is how effective gambesons were as armor. I'm going to demonstrate this through the use of my spear. This garment consists of three layers, two of stout canvas, one of thick wool. The spear goes through it without any resistance. This sort of garment exists as padding. It's almost useless without something over top of it. Now I've folded it over and quilted it together, such that it is six layers thick. Again, the spear passes through with little to no resistance. It should be noted that six layers will stop some sword cuts and some arrows from my hunting bow. Again, the spear penetrates effortlessly. Now I've folded it and quilted it again, such that the garment is 12 layers thick. The spear met some resistance this time, and penetration was limited to only 7 inches. It should be noted that 12 layers will stop most sword cuts and some arrows from my hunting bow. It is, however, completely inadequate against the spear. Now I've folded it and quilted it again, such that the panel is 24 layers thick. Again, the spear passes through. 
It should be noted that 24 layers is impossible for me to cut through with a sword or penetrate with one of my hunting bows. This time the armor succeeded in stopping the spear. Cool. Not this time though, the spear penetrated many inches. Another success. The spear only penetrated the armor by about a quarter of an inch this time. So, a 24 layer garment can stop weaker spear blows, but stronger ones can still get through. Now I've folded it again such that the panel is 48 layers thick. It's also about 4 inches thick, and I didn't have any needles that long, so I just tied it like a parcel rather than quilting it. Success! It stopped the spear and bent it quite severely. The spear is made of pretty soft steel, so I could just bend it back on my knee. Again, the armor stopped it. I can feel the point somewhere inside, but it hasn't gone all the way through. Again, the armor is successful. Here I can just feel the tip poking through the cloth, but it's not even a quarter of an inch. Here the spear was able to punch all the way through. Something I've noticed is that if the spear manages to get all the way through the armor, it tends to go very deeply. Looking at the footage in slow motion, I noticed there are two stages to the blow. The first part of the penetration is caused by the energy of the blow, but the latter part is just by the weight of the spear and my body behind it. With something like leather or steel, or with my wooden slat armor, when a blade penetrates it, the tension of the material puts friction on the blade, which reduces the penetration. This cloth doesn't seem to have the same degree of friction, which makes things more likely to go deeply if they go through at all. Again, the spear failed to penetrate and was bent severely. In conclusion, I'd say that 48 layers is enough to prevent the spear almost all of the time. Though, as we have seen, certain blows can still make it through. So, in conclusion, the Gambazon is not some magical, underrated be-all and end-all of armor. It's three separate pieces of armor with different characteristics. And it certainly doesn't invalidate other sorts of armor. It's Calvin putting on all his clothes so that he can learn how to ride a bike. And that's all I have to say for today. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.